Welcome to this teaching. I am very excited to share with you today about baptism with the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, the birth of you and me when we talk about being born again. And I'm going to share something you probably haven't heard before. Because if there is an area where Satan has deceived the church, then it has to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what it truly is. I'm sitting outside here in Mexico right now. It's a public place. It looks like this. This is my little studio. And uh, there's the birds singing in the background, as you can hear. And um, we can be interrupted uh, because it's a public place and so on. But we try to go through it and hopefully we will not get interrupted. I'm doing a series here where I've been looking at repentance and baptism in water. And now I will look at baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's a teaching I'm doing with seven churches here in Mexico. I'm teaching them, training them, where I not only lay a foundation, but I also give them practical tools how to receive and how to give. And this is also what I'm going to do today. Today I'm going to lay a foundation when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and also give some practical tools and probably I will do a few more teaching about the Holy Spirit as this is very, very important. And uh, I love it. I love this subject. Uh, just this weekend we came to a small church where many, many people had not received the Holy Spirit. And um, they did. They received the Holy Spirit one after one. And it was really, really powerful. And the first person I pray for who to receive the Holy Spirit, a woman came up from the church for healing and I asked, have you received the Holy Spirit? Do you speak in tongues? And she said, no. And there I prayed for her and she received the Holy Spirit. She started speaking in tongues. And it was really beautiful. It was powerful. And what happened? I can actually put a video in here uh, while I'm talking. I prayed for her and she received the Holy Spirit. And then I said to the church afterward, this woman had been here in this fellowship for a long time and she had not received the Holy Spirit. What if I have not come? What if I haven't been there and prayed for her? And I said, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility for the church to make sure that everyone is fully born again. And I want to say the same to you out there. It is your responsibility of course, you need to receive it first, but then it's your responsibility to give it to other people. Freely receive, freely give. And it's not only, quote unquote, only repentance we are called to lead people to. It's not only baptism in water we are called to do with people. It is also receiving the Holy Spirit. And, and in the Bible, it was one package. And, and that is, it has been a little somehow where to share the teaching where I've been focused on so much on repentance and so much on baptism water and, and now the Holy Spirit where it is divided up because in the Bible it is one package it's what they did for some Romans 6 I read the last time for you are all been united with him in a death like him and that is the baptism water where we die with Christ we are baptized into his death then we also, and then you will also be united with him a resurrection like him. That is the Holy Spirit, where the spirit that rose Christ from the dead is now coming into us and rising us from the dead. And we read that in the same book, just a few verses in chapter uh, further up or in chapter 8, verse 11. And if the Spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you, him who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lived in you. So, when Paul wrote the letter um, of Romans, it was people who have already received the Holy Spirit. It was people who have repented, who have been baptized in water, who have received the Holy Spirit. That was what the early church did when they came to faith. And not like today. When I did the meeting yesterday, there was a few hundred people yesterday, I asked here, how many was baptized as a baby? And over half of the people raised up their hands. If I asked the same in the time of 
the early church, how many was baptized as a baby, everyone will look at us like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they did not know about it at that time. When I asked yesterday, how many here repented, got baptized in water, received the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues that same day they came to faith? Everyone will raise up their hand if it happened there under the day after their Pentecost. That was what they knew. Yesterday I asked the same, and out of 200 people, there was five or six who raised up their hand. Why is it like that? Because we have come so far away from the gospel that we, let's say like that, we come from so many different directions today. Baby baptism, coming to faith, getting baptized again with immersion later, probably, or receiving the Holy Spirit, or some repent and get baptized and don't believe in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there's so many different angles we come into the faith. And therefore, it is a different time. And we misunderstand the gospel and the Bible because of our traditions, the way we Read it. Let's come with a very clear example of that. When do a person receive the Holy Spirit? Most churches today, many churches today, priests say you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe. And therefore, we put baptism of the Holy Spirit in as something extra. Some believe it only happened that time in the time of the apostle or with the baptism and gift and all of that. Some say, okay, baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today if you, for a few, <laughs> if you're lucky. Or, or, or it had to do with power of evangelizing and nothing else. That is so off. That is, that is not the Bible. I have the Bible here. That is not biblical. We did not receive the Holy Spirit automatically when we believe. Some will say, that is wrong because the Bible says so. Do the Bible says so? Let, let's look at it. Ephesians 1. And this is a very, very clear example of how we interpret the Bible wrong. Ephesians 1.13 says this. And you also was included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believe you are marked with the seal, with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So here we read that when you believe, you were marked with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he move on, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, possession to the praise of his glory. Second part here, the Holy Spirit, what is that? That is the seal. That is the deposit that's guaranteeing our inheritance until the day of redemption. When we receive the Holy Spirit, that is the adoption paper that is writing under. We are adopted, but we are not fully adopted in that sense that we are not home with our Father yet. We now have the Spirit in us that is crying out, Abba, Father, and we long to leave this body to be home with God. The, at the, the baptism of receiving the Holy Spirit is our uh, engagement ring. We are now engaged with Christ to be married. We are engaged, we belong to Him, but we are not home yet. We are not married yet. So, so the, 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 the Holy Spirit is the guaranteeing of the inheritance that is in us when Jesus Christ appears a second time to bring salvation to those who await him. So the Holy Spirit is very important. That is like we know that we belong to him. But let's look at, and I will talk more about that later, but if you go back, when do you receive that Holy Spirit? When you heard the message of the truth, when you believe, you were sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what you need to understand here is that this verse is not written to you. Paul did not say when you, means you, believe, you were sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was written to the church in Ephesus. 
It was not written to you. It was not written to me. It was written to them. And to them, he said, when you believe, you will seal with the promise of the Holy Spirit. It don't mean that everyone who believes today are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Let me come with an example. We today have Jehovah's Witness who are reading this word. Oh, when you believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Oh, we have the Holy Spirit because we believe. No, you don't. It's a different gospel. It's not the right way. We today have Mormons reading the word. Oh, when you believe, when we believe, we have the Holy Spirit. No, you don't. We have Catholics reading the same word. Oh, when we believe, we have the Holy Spirit. We have Lutheran people who read the same word. Oh, when we believe, we have the Holy Spirit. We have Baptists. We have Pentecostal. We have many different kind of church denomination of people who came to faith in many different ways. And I do like this because some people really don't believe in the biblical way. But there's also people who truly believe in the biblical way without having received the Holy Spirit. And, and this is going to be clear as we move on. And what is very important to understand here is that this is not written to you. It was written to them. And we have a problem today because we have so many church denominations and so many different ways people start their faith and how they believe. We have a guy who baptized last week. He repented, he got baptized, and he received the Holy Spirit when he believed. He was one of those yesterday who raised up their hand and said, I got the Holy Spirit when I believed. If I were write to him, I would say, Hey, Ritz, when you believed, did you not receive the Holy Spirit? He said, Yes, I did. But I know of other people who grow up in church and have had faith in Christ in many years without having received the Holy Spirit. I will not be able to write the same to those people. I will write to them, hey, did you not sometime after you believed was sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit or received the Holy Spirit? And they say yes. So you see context, context, context. And now we are going to look at How did they believe those people Paul wrote to? Because he wrote in Ephesus. Ephesus won't start like this, to the holy people in Ephesus. So he wrote to the people in Ephesus and not to you and me. How did they receive the Holy Spirit? How did they come to faith those people Paul wrote to? It's written, book of Acts 19. If we go there, we read in book of Acts 19 that Paul, he took the road and arrived in Ephesus. And there he met some disciples. Disciples of who? Yeah. Those people were disciples of John. John's disciple. They were only baptized with the baptism of John. And, and not with Christ. And they did not know of the Holy Spirit. They did not know of all of this. So they were disciples of John. And they'll be clear as you read the text. So we are reading Acts 19, verse 2. Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why ask a question like this if everyone automatically received the Holy Spirit when they believe? Just Paul asking that question shows that you do not utterly automatically receive the Holy Spirit when you believe. That is the proof. Otherwise, you never ask that. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? It's the same that asks, did you get wet when you are baptized? Of course you got wet when you are baptized, because baptized means immersion. You cannot be baptized without being wet. So when Paul asks, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe, it reveals that it's possible to believe without receiving the Holy Spirit. And they answered, no, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. And that is what many people do today. They're like, I, I don't know about the Holy Spirit, or, or I, I think I have, or I have heard something of the Holy Spirit that is wrong from the Bible. <laughs> many different people have a faith in God and have many different views of the Holy Spirit. 
And some pe- people have not received, and some people think they have received, but have not. Some people have not heard, some people have. It's different. And he asked him, when he asked him, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That is a really good question to ask them. I do that today. When, when I meet people, I don't ask, hey, what church denomination are you from? Because there's people who say, hey, I'm a Pentecostal. But they come there one, two times a year and they've never received the Holy Spirit. Or I'm a Baptist, but they truly have received the Holy Spirit. There's people in different church denominations, even they are in a church denomination, they have not or they have. So instead of asking what church are you part of, I often ask, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Or I actually don't ask that. I often ask, do you speak in tongues? Because that is the proof we are going to look at later. And if they said, um, what? I, I know, okay, they, they, they are not there yet. They, they, they come from that setting or they have not heard about it. Or if I ask, hey, do you speak in tongues? And they said, no, no. Do you want to? Yeah. Okay, then I know a little more of where they come from and then I pray for them. So, so that is a really good question when you meet people. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe or have, do you speak in tongues? And what you're going to see when Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit or did you speak in tongues? They said no, he did something about it. He did something about it. And that is what you and me are called to. If we meet somebody who have not yet receive the Holy Spirit, we do something about it. Like, I think this week I I prayed for nine people who received the Holy Spirit or something like that. Beautiful. I love it. One woman saw a a sharp light come over her and she fall down and she actually received the Holy Spirit. But let let me just put a small clip in there where you can actually see it. Can can, can you say, how are you? What's happening? So this happened just this weekend and, and it's beautiful. So we are called to do something about it. But we read on here. So he continues, what baptism did you receive? And they said John the baptism and John's baptism. And, and John, he baptized in water with repentance, but said they should believe in him who come after, that is Jesus Christ. And he explained it. And John the Baptist, and there was before the cross, there was not an identifying with the death of Christ because Jesus had not yet died at the time in the Gospels. So the baptism of John disappeared or after the cross, and now we became baptized in the name of Jesus into Christ, where we die with Christ, as I spoke about in the last lesson. So John said, explained that uh, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance and told people who should believe who, him who came after. And then we read, here in this, they were first baptized in the name of Jesus. They were baptized in the name of Jesus in water. And when Paul placed hands on them, the Holy Spirit came over them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Do we believe that Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever? Yes. Do we believe the Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today and forever? Yes. Is people still sinners? Yes. Is gospel still the same? Yes. Should we experience this today also? Therefore, yes. But many people believe that cease. That is not for today or it's not for everyone. But here he placed the hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. How did we know they received the Holy Spirit? Because they spoke in tongues and prophesied. When do you know a cup is full when it's flowing over? Placing on the hands is what is the norm, what they did. In Acts 8, when Philip came to Samaria, they repented, they got baptized, but they did not receive the Spirit 
there. And that also shows that you can repent and be baptized without receiving the Spirit. So when the apostle came there, they saw that they have not yet received the Spirit. The word receive the Spirit and baptize with the Spirit is the same words. Some people think, oh, receiving the Spirit is one thing, baptism with the Holy Spirit is something else. Read Acts 8. It's not. They did not come there. When they came there, they did not say, oh, they have not yet been baptized with the Spirit. In this setting, they use the word receive the Spirit. And then he, they place hand on them and they receive the Spirit. And there is a visible sign when people receive the Spirit. So there was a guy called Simon. He saw that the, laying on, uh, that the Spirit was given by the laying on of hands. He saw it. He saw that when the apostles laid hands on them, they received the Spirit. There is a sign that is visible when people receive the Spirit. Not only for the po- person who received, but for the people who are looking at it. Who is praying. And don't build on your tradition here, please. Let's look at the Bible. Some people will say, yeah, but here we see that it was Peter and John who placed their hands. It's only the apostles and it ceased with them. No, no, no. Why did Philip not lay hands on people himself and pray for them? I believe Philip could have done that. Why didn't he do it? Why don't you sometimes do it? Why don't you? If you had the Holy Spirit, you can also do it. Why don't you? Why do, do, did I not always do it? There was a few years in my life as I was even an evangelist preaching the gospel, but I, I did not pray for people with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, I did not know about it. In, in that sense, I prayed and nothing happened, and that was just where I was. Philip, he was a deacon. He was... He was one who was taking care of the tables and helping there. That was his ministry, a deacon, practical ministry, serving in the church. And then persecution came, and suddenly he ended up in Samaria because of persecution. And he did what he knew about, what he was able to do at that time. And he needed help for somebody else, like today. You don't need to be an apostle at that time to pray for baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul, he prayed for the people in Ephesus to receive the Holy Spirit. But who prayed for Paul? A disciple called Ananias. A disciple called Ananias prayed for Paul and Paul received the Holy Spirit. That was not one of the apostles, it was a disciple. If you have received the Holy Spirit, you can pray for other people to receive the Holy Spirit. Freely give, freely receive. Oh, freely receive, freely give. That is what I should say. You are free. Receive it from nothing. Give it from nothing. Lay hands on people. Give the Holy Spirit. Lay hands on them. This is what we are called to do. And, and it's not about being an apostle, not being an apostle. It's about obeying Christ and do what he has called us to do. But we see it is laying on our hands. And we also see there that there is a sign. You don't see the sign there in Acts 8. But if you go to Acts 19... Peter, he was in the house of Cornelius the Gentiles, and we looked a little about that last time, and he suddenly was convinced. His eyes was open that God had granted repentance to the Gentiles, salvation to the Gentiles. What happened? While he was speaking, the Holy Spirit came over them, and they start to speak in tongues. Whoa, they have received the Holy Spirit like us. What forgive, forbid them water to be baptized? Why did Peter not just lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit when he came in? Because in his mind, the gospel was only for the Jews at that time. But receiving the Spirit was what convinced him that God had granted repentance to those people. And therefore, he baptized them right away. So, Peter... It was very special in the house of Cornelius. And in Acts 11, Peter, he came to, um, to the apostles or to the elders in Jerusalem. And he explained why he was in the house of the Gentiles. Because they're like, what are you as a Jew doing in the house of Gentiles? And Peter started to explain what happened in Acts 10. And he said, as I began to spe- speak, the Holy Spirit came over them as he has come over us in the beginning. And then he remembered the word. 
John baptized with water, but you be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if God gave them the same gift, when the Bible talks about the gift, is the Holy Spirit is prefer, uh, referring to. When God gave them the same gift, it's not like some people, oh, I have the gift of, 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 of helping, I have the gift of giving, but I don't need to speak in tongues. And pro no, is it a gift? <laughs> we talk about that another time. If God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believe in Jesus Christ, who was I that could stand in God's way? When they heard this, there was no future objections. And they praised God, saying, Even the Gentiles, God have granted repentance to life. So when they heard that those Gentiles start to speak in tongues and then was baptized in water just after. When they heard of the Holy Spirit pouring out and they speak in tongues, they have no future objection. They just start to praise God saying, whoa, God have granted repentance of life to the Gentiles. That is where the New birth is truly taking place. That is where the Spirit of God is poured out of people. And I want to talk about some misunderstandings there. A typical Pentecostal view of looking, and I had that years ago, is that in John 20, 22, after Jesus rose, we read here, Jesus rose, appeared to his disciples, and then he said, peace be with you as the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. And I'm sending you. And then he breathed on them, say, receive the Holy Spirit. Most, many people today teach that here you receive the Holy Spirit. Here you are born again by the Spirit. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is something extra, something that comes in Pentecost for they had to do with evangelizing. You know. It only had to do with that time. It only had to do with a few people. If you are in the right church denomination, you get it. If you're in another church denomination, you don't get it. I at one time believed the same, that the gift of the Holy Spirit, uh, that receiving the Holy Spirit, they did that there. And then there was a, a, a let's say, a, extra filling with the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. I, 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 I'm, I was wrong. It's, it's not like that. And I see that very, very clear. Uh, let me explain here. While P P Jesus was walking on earth, he did not baptize people with the Holy Spirit. He could not give the Spirit. It was the Spirit of Christ. He could first send after he had been glorified and ascended to heaven, to his Father. And then the Spirit of Christ will be come down here. And then those who are dead <laughs> become alive by the Spirit. We are his body, he's the head, and we as his body is now filled with his Spirit. That could not happen while Jesus was still walking here on earth. Because the Spirit was still in him. He could not give the Spirit while he was walking here on earth. And we see that in John 7 where he said, Believe in me and as the scriptures say, water, uh, uh, rivers of living water will flow out from within you. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believe in him later will receive. Up to this time, the Spirit have not yet been given, since Jesus have not yet been glorified. So the Spirit was not given at the time Jesus was walked on earth. He could not because he was not yet being glorified. And when did that happen? When he ascended to the Father. John 14, he's talking about the Spirit whom the Father was sent in my name. The Spirit was not sent yet when he talked about the Spirit in John 14. John 15, 16, verse 7, he said, It is the best for you that I go away. Unless I go away, 
This advocate, the spirit will not come to you, but when I go, I will send him to you. When did he go away? It was not when he rose up again and in the 40 days period appearing for his disciples and speaking to him after resurrection. It was at the ascension when he lived on a cloud we are going to look at. So I, in John 20, he blew on them and said, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. After that, and we see that it's not written in John, but in Luke 24, we read here that after that, he said, I'm going to send you what my father had promised, but stay in the city until you be closed with the power from on high. What has the father promised him? To send the Holy Spirit. So, day after he blew on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, the last word he said is actually, stay in Jerusalem until you receive what the Father had promised. They did not receive the Spirit when he blew on them. Read the text, nothing happened. Nothing happened in John 20, 22 when he blew on them and said, receive the Spirit. Not there at least. But what are you going to see when he ascended to heaven, he blow again. <sighs> As a mighty wind, he blow from heaven and the spirit came and filled everyone. It was a prophetic sign of what will happen later. And it's very clear if we read it in, in, in Acts 1, we read here that after his suffering, Jesus appeared for them with many proof that he was alive over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 40 days, that is important to note. Jesus spoke to them, appeared for them over a period of 40 days. And one occasion when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised with you heard me speak about. John 14, John 16 and other places. John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Baptized, Holy Spirit, received Holy Spirit is one and the same. You see that in Acts 8, they came and they have not yet received the Spirit. Those repented, baptized believers have not yet received the Spirit. And then what happened? The day of Pentecost came, Acts 2, and they were all together at one place. The day of Pentecost came. That is important to note. Pentecost, that is the Jewish festival known as the Feast of Weeks and the Sabbath. The Feast of Weeks and the Sabbath. That what was it was. What is the Feast of Wheat? What is the Sabbath? The Feast of Weeks is the first fruit where they, after they were saved out of Egypt, celebrating the first fruit as a gift to God. Saviot, what is that? That is the giving of the law of Mount Sinai when Moses came with the Ten Commandments. So what happens here? All the Jews from all over came to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Not to celebrate the pouring out of the Holy Spirit as we do today, because that had not happened yet. But they came to celebrate the first fruit and the giving of the law with Mount Sinai. When did that happen? 50 days after Passover, where they celebrated the Passover land that was slaughtered and how they were saved out of Egypt. So what do we see now in the New Testament? On Passover, <laughs> Jesus was our Passover lamb who was slaughtered on the cross. He rose up again. He appears for his disciple over a time of 10 days. And then he say, wait in Jerusalem. And there he ascended to heaven. 
eller så vi her pair for his disciple over a period of 40 days. He said to his disciple, wait in Jerusalem, and then he ascended to heaven. Ten days later, on Pentecost, on Saviot, on the Feast of Weeks, he sent his Holy Spirit down here. And there the church was born. Hallelujah. It's going to be more interesting. You're going to see things. What happened here? This is the birth. This is the birth. This is, but well, let me find some scripture here. This is what we read that was prophesied 600 years before by Jeremiah, by Ezekiel. Jeremiah is 33, 31, 33 said this. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel at that time, declared the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. Moses came on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments. On the day of Pentecost, Saviot. There was a picture of later when Christ came to write the law as the prophet that was greater than Moses, not write the law on Ten Commandments now, but write the law on our heart. He take out the stone heart that commands was written on and gave us a new heart. And that is why it happened that day. Ezekiel 11, 19 saying, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. When did he put the new spirit in them? On that day. Not in John 20, 22. That was just, that was another day. It could not happen on that day. It could not happen on that day. It needed to happen on this day. Why? Like Pentecost could not happen on any other, uh, uh, Passover, the cross could not happen on any other day. The cross needed to happen on the day of Passover, like the birth of the church, the new heart, the new spirit needed to happen on Pentecost. It needed to happen those days. It could not happen any other days. So to believe that we receive the Holy Spirit when we come to faith and use John 20 as a sim is, is wrong. Yes, let's listen. No one can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draws that person. That is correct. Coming to God is a work of the Spirit. Repentance is a work by the Spirit. Baptism water is where the Spirit is working. But as Jesus said to his disciples, you have had the Spirit with you, but he will be with in you, in you. you. Many today have the Spirit with them, or working with them, but they don't have the Spirit in them. They have not yet received a new Spirit in them, as Ezekiel is prophesying. And he said, I will remove from their hearts, I will remove from them their hearts of stone and give them a new heart of flesh. Why? Then they will follow my decree and be careful to keep my laws. They will be my people and I will be their God. That is so, so powerful. That is the new birth. What the law could not do, Christ did. Giving us a new heart and a new spirit. And now it's not about trying to memorize the Ten Commands. We are dead to the law as we saw in the last lesson when we talked about baptism. And now... We walk a new life by the Spirit. And if you walk by the Spirit, you are automatically fulfilling the law of Christ. It's about the Spirit now and not the old stone's laws. Oh, there's so much more to say about this. The church was not born again on the cross. The church was not born again in John 20. The church was born on Pentecost. So many people in the churches today are not fully born again yet. They have repentance correct. They have faith correct. Some even have baptism in water correct. But you can be all of that without receiving the Spirit. You need to be fully born again from above of water 
and spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus said, Jesus said in John 3. And let's look at John 3, what he said. He is very, very important. He talked about being born again and he said this, and you need to look at this. John 3, 7. You should not be surprised I'm saying you must be born again. The word born again means born from above. It's a spiritual birth. And many, many people have misunderstood those words when Jesus said you need to be born out of water and spirit. Some people say water is natural birth and spirit is the spiritual birth. But it made no sense. Because everyone Jesus ever spoke to or everyone we ever speak to are already born in the natural. So Jesus should not just say you need to be born out of spirit. It's like I say to a human being today, say to you, hey, you need to do two things. You need to be born out of your mom's wounds as a pe person, and then you need to be born by the spirit. I would never say that and spirit to somebody who's already born in the natural. <laughs> so when Jesus said you need to be born out of water and spirit, water there is The baptism and spirit is receiving the spirit. And he told that to who? Those who already repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is near and you need to be born out of water and spirit to enter into the kingdom of God. And then he moved on. The wind blows where it pleased and you hear its sound. You don't know where it comes from, where it goes. So it is with everyone born by the spirit. This is a very bad translation. The wind blows. The word the wind blows. The wind here is the same word, Greek word, strong concordance 4151, as the word spirit in the same words. So the wind blows. That is for everyone who's born by the spirit. That is the same Greek word in the same words. You can look it up. Same Greek word in same words, one place translated to spirit, one place translated to wind. This word is 385 times in the Bible and out of 385 times there is only one time they have translated with wind and that is in John 3.8. Why? I don't know. But why do you translate it with wind? It's not the wind that blows. It is the spirit that blows. But the word blows could actually translate it with breathe. And the word sound could translate it with voice. And Wycliffe, very strong Wycliffe translation, have done it correct like some other, but Wycliffe translation has translated this words like this. The spirit breathe where he will. You hear this, his, his voice. You do not know where he comes from, where he goes, so it, it is each man born of the spirit. <laughs> Listen, that is the spirit breathe. And you hear his voice. And this is for everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus in John 20, he breathed on them. <sighs> Received the Spirit. But there was no voice. There was no sound. They did not receive. Why? He could not because he had not been glorified. After he breathed on them, he said, wait in Jerusalem unto you receive, unto I will breathe again. What happened on Pentecost? They were all gathering and suddenly as a mighty sound or as a mighty breath, Jesus from heaven breathed again on them and the Spirit came and filled everyone up. How did they know? They heard the voice of the Spirit as they start to speak in tongues. And in the next list, I'm going to talk about the misunderstanding about tongues, that there's different kind of tongues. 
There is the tongues as language people understand, but there is also tongues that have to be interpreted, and there is the tongues that is for the edification of yourself. And then there is the tongues I'm using speaking to you now. There is four different tongues, and people sometimes misunderstand that, and therefore they say that what we do when we they call babbling shilodokoskusile. That is not tongues because no one understands it. No, no one understands it because it's not that kind of tongues. I'm going to talk about that in the next lesson. But here we see the spirit breathe, and this is for everyone who is born of the spirit. Hallelujah! Oh, this is so powerful. When do you know for sure that a birth has taken place in the natural? A baby can come out of the womb and still be dead. When do you know there is life? When you, that baby breathe in the air. Air is the root word sp wind, spirit is related. And cry out in tongues. <laughs> The baby are crying. Most beautiful sound in the world. Especially first time, but after a few weeks it don't sound so good anymore. Be quiet, I need to sleep. Um, when do we know a person is truly born of the spirit? When they breathe, the spirit breathe in them. And they will cry out in tongues. New tongues. Then we know a birth have been taking place. They are now born again. Like you are born in the natural, the baby is in the womb. You have to turn around, repent. The head is upside and then they repent. But it's still somehow in, in darkness. But in repentance, it comes out from darkness to light. And then you cut their bellicose line. You cut their old life. Or you go see a picture, they come out through water. It's a picture of the baptism where you leave your old life behind. But that is not enough. You need to breathe in the air and cry out in tongues. And you know life has taken place. There is people who think they have the spirit but have not. They are not truly born again. There is also people who have truly received the spirit but don't speak in tongues. But if you are born again by the Spirit, you have tongues in you. And you just need to open your mouth and let it out. Because it is for everyone who is born again. And I'm going to look at that in the next lesson. I just want to end up, it is for everyone. On Pentecost, Peter continues there and said, In the last days, and that happened there on Pentecost, God will pour, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Are you all people? Yes. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Are you a son or are you a daughter? Then you should prophesy. Your young man will see vision. Are you a young man? Then you should see vision. A young man will see vision. The old man will dream dreams. Are you old? Are you young? Are you a son? Are you a daughter? Are you on all people? Then it's for you. Even the servant, both men and women, I will pull out my spirit in those days and they'll prophesy. Are you a servant? Are you a man or are you a woman? Then it is for you. How do you receive it? Come back to the Bible. We have done so much like pray Jesus into your heart. You, there is no sinner's prayer in the Bible. Let's get it in. Why do we keep say invite people to also call and say ask Jesus into your heart? It is not biblical. You don't receive Jesus in your heart. Jesus is in heaven. It's the Holy Spirit you now receive. How? They were caught to the heart. Peter, what uh, brothers, what shall we do? Peter said, repent. In that order, repent. And I talked about repentance a few days ago. What it truly is, go in and see the teaching. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. I talked about that a few days ago. Go in and see this teaching. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who is far out, for all who the Lord God will call. The problem is that we don't preach the full gospel. And many people today believe without repentance. Many people repent without baptism. Many people have been baptized without receiving. 
and people are deceived. We don't understand the full gospel. And why should we repent? Because there is a day where our Lord Jesus will return and bring salvation to those who have waited him. And the Holy Spirit is the seal we have received unto the day of redemption when he returned. That is the guaranteeing we have. We need to examine the gospel and come back to the gospel. There are so many people, I said it before, who accuse me and say, Tom, you preach baptism in water as more than uh, baptism regeneration. I don't preach that. Look at my teaching. And people say, Tom, but, but you preach baptism in water that, that is not faith alone that's safe. <laughs> Understand how they entered into their faith. Look at my teaching. But you preach something unbiblical. Let's start with this. When did people get baptized in water in the early church, in the book of Acts? That was after the cross, when the new covenant had started. When did people get baptized in the water? Right away. Right away. So let's start with this. If you don't yourself baptize people, right away they come to faith. Don't accuse me of preaching something else. If you don't have the same practice, as they had in the Bible, I guarantee you it's because you don't have the same theology as they had in the Bible. If you understood what baptism truly is, you will have the same practice. And that's where I start. When people accuse me of preaching something wrong when it comes to baptism water, I would say, okay, you don't do what the Bible says. If you don't have the same practice, why should I listen to you? You are deceived. You are not doing what they did, and that is because you don't believe what they believed. Let's keep it simple. A child can figure it out. Give the Bible to a 10-year-old and they understand it, but be on seminary and you don't. You have complicated the word. You have put the word of God out of power because of your traditions. The same with the baptism in water. Or baptism with the Holy Spirit, sorry. If you don't see people filled with the Spirit, speaking tongues and prophesying, or speaking tongues and worshiping God, or, or if you don't see there's a visible sign for everyone, then you have a wrong theology. You have a wrong theology because you have a wrong practice. And that is what it is today. There is many people who say, we have the right theology, but look at the practice. Look at the evidence. The evidence, if the evidence is missing, then the theology is wrong. And we need to go back to the truth. There is a great, great deception happening already now. Jesus said in last days, we are in the last days, many shall be deceived. And we see the deception inside the charismatic movement that people prophesy heal the sick, but they don't follow Christ and live a holy life as is part of being full of the Spirit and walk by the Spirit. There should be fruit of the Spirit also. They only have the gift but not the fruit. That is a deception. Or there's people who say we have the fruit but we don't have the gift. That is also deception. We need it all. Hallelujah. I'm preaching here. Please see the other teaching I did if you haven't about repentance in, and baptism water. And then I want to do one more about the Holy Spirit, uh, probably here within a few days, where I talk about the different kind of tongues and some of the deception that is going on there. Uh, and uh, yeah, God bless you. See it. Let's fight for the gospel. Let's fight for the gospel. Fight for the truth. I have many more hours teaching about this. I'll put in a link in a series I did some years called Fighting for the True Gospel. Uh, because we need that. God bless you all. Live strong with Jesus. Make disciples. And see you another time. Bye-bye.